If you are the kind of visionary who is building a business or looking for businesses and startups to invest in, today's guest on the League of Visionaries podcast is someone you will want to meet. He practices and teaches a build-in public approach, a strategy that can attract the right kind of talent, new business, partnerships, and investors to your business. And LinkedIn is the platform that he uses to do all that. Meet Rainier Lombard of flans.co.za, the true model of building in public. Welcome to the League of Visionaries podcast by Yazi Media. The League of Visionaries podcast is your place to meet visionaries, professionals, entrepreneurs, and other thought leaders with a visionary message to share. This podcast is for you if you too are a visionary driven by a deeper purpose in your work, your play, and your investments. I'm your host, Marie-Thérèse Leroux, the media strategist with soul and founder and owner of Yazi Media Virtual Media House. Connect with this league of visionaries as we explore the power of purpose and how to bring it to the world through your message. This season of the League of Visionaries podcast is brought to you by Totally Morpheus, creators of the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment. It's fast, it's fun, it's free, and it points the way to your living leadership legacy. Rene Lombard of flans.co.za. Thank you so much for being on the League of Visionaries podcast. We can't wait to hear what you have to say. Ah, oh, amazing. Thank you very much for having me. We really, really appreciate being here. Hello to the listeners. Hello to everyone. That's uh, And I hope we can add some value throughout the session. Absolutely fantastic, because what you do is groundbreaking, and it's the kind of thing that I think visionaries need to know about. But before we go there, Rainier, I have a question about the name of your company. And well, I kind of got this answered a second ago, because on your website, you actually have the question, where do you think yeah. the name comes from? And there's a little quiz to get people involved. Now, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. What is your thinking behind doing it that way? It's such, a, it's such a unique name. And a lot of people do ask, where does Florence come from? What is Florence? It doesn't roll off the tongue as, as nicely as one would think as well, but it's, it's, it is unique. We do call ourselves Florence Directive Creators. We, we direct creation. So what, what it really means is in Afrikaans, you get a, uh, a word called Samge Florence, which is a word to, that describes throwing a lot of things together to make it beautiful. So if you put a bouquet together, you're making a beautiful bouquet out of a lot of different flowers, for example. And, and that's where it comes from, uh, flans, which is throwing a lot of beautiful things together to make it beautiful. <laughs> Definitely. Um, it's, so I didn't come up with the name. Um, I actually merged with the company about seven years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So the original founder, Eugene Mayer, he came up with the name 13 years ago. And they start, Flans started 13 years ago. And then I came into the picture about eight years ago, and we merged seven years ago, uh, our two agencies, and we kept Flance as the main company. And I, I then, uh, you know, became the MD of the, uh, of the group of those two companies. Um, so it's, I didn't come up with the name. My, my previous company was called Social Animal, uh, and that was a digital, uh, digital marketing agency. And that then fell away, um, and we then now call ourselves Flance. Yeah. Oh, right. But you do know that you're sometimes still known as the social animal. People definitely. do still refer to you that way. So it's it, the brand stuck. Uh, yes, but definitely. France is definitely working. And now you mentioned the directive creators aspect of it, of really building content and building the, the presence of different, your clients, essentially, and of course, yourselves. But there's an extra element to that. And this is what I think makes your work so fascinating is the building in public concept, especially with a view to attracting talent, to bringing in new business, of course, but also partnerships. And uh, then the very, very vital thing for many startups, investment. Would you like to tell us more about that very exciting element of what you do? Definitely. So the whole the whole premise of building in public is it's not it's not completely new, but there, it hasn't been something that people practice in the past. You know, a lot of business owners, a lot of founders, they they were taught to keep their IP, their knowledge, their everything behind closed doors and build in stealth. They were taught that they were said they said don't be in public, don't be in the PR, try and build in stealth because you don't want to share your secret source. Okay. And I think that is very archaic, in my opinion. I think it's something that that belongs in the 90s. And I think that it is something that 
that, that really closes you off to a lot of opportunities at the end of the day. So what we do at the at, at the company is, yes, we are a digital agency and we are a LinkedIn agency, but we do help, as you say, a lot of businesses take what they do and document how they do things, how they create, how they develop, how they hire, how they actually do business. Because what that really shows you is the transparency behind the business. You have access to the leaders and they're sharing their journey because for them, they're in their own race. There isn't, there aren't competitors with these, with these companies. So many of them are the unicorn. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of the business that we deal with that are following this kind of strategy, their only competitor is them the previous day. They're only trying to be better than their previous self. And that's what a building public strategy really is, is to share what you're doing, the value of how you're doing it, and documenting even the failures. If something's happened that that could be seen as a quite a negative to, to share, share it. Share what, what you're doing, share your hurdles, share how you've tackled those hurdles. Because if you if you can uh, communicate a certain hurdle that you've that you've overcome, that just gives you ultimate credibility because you're not, you're not showing someone, right, I, I messed up at this thing, you know, but this is what I did to fix it. And now we won't mess up again doing this particular thing. And people look at this and like, wow, this is so refreshing. Like, I don't see this. I don't see people being this vocal about their failures because you think, oh, no, I should only give them a highlight reel about success and how well we're doing. And to be honest, if you're a founder and you're not going through hurdles and you're not getting challenged on a daily basis and you're not failing, you're doing something wrong, to be honest. You have you're not growing. You're not you're not putting yourself out there. Uh, those failures are key to getting getting your product and vision perfect at the end of the day. And you can't get it perfect without going through failures and and a, a few hurdles. Yeah, that's really phenomenal because in business there has long been almost a, a motivational element to failure that we say mm. fail successfully learn from your mistake and it's only failure if you're not learning from it this approach of building in public actually makes that almost a selling point it's a credibility builder it's an empathy builder and like you say it is so incredibly refreshing when we see people out there who make mistakes and post pandemic this is even more so because the build in public thing i think has been going since maybe since the yeah. 2000s but yeah. it evolved and it's got more credibility over time because of the great examples of companies that yeah, have done yeah. that and places that started as tiny startups that then exploded and many of them were taken over and so there really is merit in this. But Definitely. post pandemic, we all got into our authenticity rush because I think we were all confronted with just that things can be hard and that we can be open about this. And we've become incredibly suspicious of when things look all perfect. But for other companies and small bullet businesses and startups, there's really something in that merit of knowing there are other people out there who are also making mistakes and that's generous right to go share the mistakes that other people don't have to make it at least make new ones right definitely definitely there's there's such value in it and and i'd like you know if you if you want to know more about this go and look at what buffer has been doing that uh, there's another company called ghost they're the alternative to wordpress they publish their their monthly recurring revenue they publish what they do they they, they show you their their actual figures of how the company is doing. And you can subscribe to their, their kind of uh, build in public uh, strategy and you become a cheerleader and you're like, wow, this company, is, I want to use the product because clearly something's working. Investors look at it, they're like, I want to be part of this because it's it's just building on success. And yes, they do have some down months, but that's part of the journey. Part of knowing you know, what the mistakes were made and then how they're just tackling those and, and what was tackled. So a lot of companies, you know, they'll They'll sit there and they'll say, hey, are we just, we're amazing. This is how much we make. This is, but you know, at the back of, at the end of the day, if they haven't been vocal about their, you know, their failures as well, it's, you, you question it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Um, we follow it for our own agency. I try and, you know, try, I, I try and build in public quite often. I'm actually putting a post out there probably in the next few days to talk about how a client fired us and what happened and why the client fired us. Mm -hmm. And and the whole reason behind that, and, and actually it's not a bad thing when you get fired by a client, because when you're scaling as a business, and, and I'll give you a, I'll give you a little, you know, a little key of secret here. If you're a small business and you need to and you want to scale and you want to get to a certain size of business, you have to be very okay losing a lot of clients. And you're gonna be have to be very okay losing a lot of talent at the same time. There is gonna be people that leave, clients will leave because 
as you grow and as you scale, your processes weren't... So if you have, for example, five clients and you want to get to 50 clients, your processes for five clients is very different to a 50 client company. So your processes and systems need to change. And with that change comes a lot of turmoil, a lot of, you know, so you're going to have to be completely comfortable with losing a lot of clients, but then taking each loss and evaluating it and saying, what actually happened? Was it expectation? Was it results? Was it the team members? Was it our training? Was it our reporting? Was it interaction was a communication. So you have to take your failures, really analyze them and build on that because the more clients you lose, actually the better, to be honest with you. I actually had a conversation with one of the, the founding team members of Investec back in the day. And mm-hmm. he said, Renier, in the first five years of Investec, it was the most horrific time of the business. We lost so much business. It was turmoil. No one knew what they were doing. We lost countless clients. We couldn't retain clients because they were in a a very big scale and growth mode. And what they did and the strategy behind it was they had to have a a very strong business dev team to just get new business to throw it back to the team. So as soon as they would be able to get new business, they would get thrown back to the team and the team would have to figure out how to retain these individuals. And it took them about five years to really get to a point that they stopped losing clients and they stopped growing from there. So if, when you see a big business, it's because they've lost thousands, if not yeah, millions of clients over the years, because every little loss is a reiteration and you, you're building on those losses. So if you look at a big business, don't think they, they don't lose clients. That is built on a lot of loss uh, in the past. And if you want to grow as a business, you have to be completely okay with that and just know that it's part of the journey. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm going to be talking about in that post. That looks like a post to look out for because there is a happy ending to the story of yeah. Investec and they started out with yeah perhaps a, quite an elite client base. But what happened through this refinement process is that they now have the one of the most elite client bases in the That's region, it. I think, and they're known yeah. only for that. So yes, they lost their everyday clients. Yeah. And uh, there's true. a lot of inspiration in that because I think a lot of visionaries, especially the ones who are starting out with a business, are very scared of losing mm. and like every little client, every little That's possibility exactly needs to be clung to. But yeah. you don't need to cling if you know that there's room. And another powerful strategy there is actually finding, you mentioned partnerships. And for a growing business, one of the great strategies could be, and I think this is something that that you tap in some of your work, finding partners. Because if you work with a client who is used to working with one person in a one-man business, and they want to have that individual attention, it can't happen if you have 50 clients. But you may know somebody who's starting out who can take them over and then have the guidance. You have a very strong collaborative approach. Now, uh, your LinkedIn posts are gold and uh, your building a public strategy there is amazing. And you do something that not everybody has the guts to do. And that is you put in long, full text posts. Definitely. Would, Would you like to tell us more about that and why it works? Because you have amazing engagement on your full text post. Apparently, people still read, Rainier. <laughs> so, so that is built up over time as well. It's a momentum and consistency of creating relationships with people on LinkedIn over time. That, that engage, so I get a good 3 4% engagement rate on my posts because people that engage, I engage on their posts. I've built relationships. I've maybe met a few of them. And you build up this community around you that engage because you're also adding value to what they're doing. And a lot, this is what a lot of people don't realize that when they, when they are posting on LinkedIn, they just expect people to engage and comment. And But are you doing that? Are you actually adding value to their lives? Are you commenting on their stuff? Are you treating them the same as the way you would want to be treated? And the more you do that, the more people engage with you and the more they, they'll comment and help you. And that's why engagement is not just a, it's not just you stumble across it. You actually have to build engagement, but it's every day chipping away at that engagement kind of strategy, the relationship strategy, the meeting, the networks. At the end of the day, you'll have a hundred to 300 people that you've actually built up this little mini relationship that you've met via LinkedIn. And those are the ones that are engaging. And then that just, that's a, that's a snowball effect. Then other people will start engaging and it just keeps on going. Justin Walsh teaches us very well when he first started out. I think he's got about four, 400,000 odd people following him at the moment. And he started just like that. He started engaging very heavily, maybe 40, 50 comments a day. So he was very, very heavy in the beginning. And he met people. He, he gave free advice. He did this. And then it just snowballed into this mammoth thing that he gets 
I think any post that he puts out there will get two, 3,000 engagements on a single piece of post. And that's all organic. So it's just knowing that it's not by accident. It doesn't happen by accident. You have to craft your engagement. You have to craft the, the network around you. And it's hard. You have to put the work and time into it, to be very honest. Yeah. And it's also the, the quality of the content. Because I Definitely. do realize when I look at your posts, there is such value that you give people. And it's so specifically for your audience. You know, for somebody else, it might not mean anything at all. But it's really the gold for the kind of people who already are connected with you, but also the ones who are probably out there looking for you. Definitely, definitely. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I, I'm, I'm very passionate about LinkedIn. I think it's, it's something that if I used 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first started my career, I would be 10 times where I am at the moment. The relationships you build up on this is fantastic. And it's a worldwide community. I've built up such beautiful relationships with people around the world that it's just expanded uh, from there. And I, I get to go around the world because of those relationships. And it's, it's an international community at the end of the day. And just, just to go back to the building public kind of topic, and the reason why also, you know, we're helping a lot of startups do this. So us as a business, we also kind of a little bit of an incubator. We, we invest in startups uh, here and there. And the, the whole concept of us helping startups do this came from a few startups that we invested in that went bust. So we... I was going to go there. Yes, let's hear about this because <laughs> there are lessons learned, right? We're building it Definitely. public right now. Definitely. And, and because that is, you can't just put your money in. You've yeah. got to see where does it go. So do tell us more, Rainier. Fantastic. So there's been three startups that have, we've invested in the last, say, two or three years that I didn't fully know who the person, who the owner really was until we got, got into business together. And it was a big, it was a big eye-opening movement after the last one actually failed. And, and knowing that, you know, when you, when you start investing in startups, you have to know who you're investing in because it's not the idea you're investing in. It's the individual you're investing in. And the, the reason why the last three st startups failed is because we, we, we were backing the wrong jockey to say it in, in, in better terms. Um, the ideas were great. The pitches were great. It was all great on paper. But the jockeys that we invested in were the wrong jockeys. And those were the founders. And if only I put it put a bit more effort and time into getting to know the, the founders over time, we probably wouldn't have invested in the companies in the first place. So we would have avoided all that loss. So what we're doing at the moment is really you know, saying to businesses and, and startups, Build in public so that investors can know who you are and start building this relationship online that understands how you do business, how you go about business. And you know, I've spoken to a few VCs and angels after these these, these failures, and that's what they said to me. They're like, Renee, we don't invest in ideas. Investors don't really do that. Like, if you come and pitch me your idea, we won't invest in it. We will only invest in companies that don't need our money. Now, that's an interesting that's an interesting thing that to to actually put out there because when you put a million, two, five, 10 million rand into a business, don't give them money that they can experiment with and it's a testing phase. And businesses that have bootstrapped, that have started, regardless of investment, that are running, that are, uh, that are achieving a profit that's actually going, but they could use the investment to 10x their business. Those are the, the, the businesses that you want to invest in. So it's not the, the, guy with, the guy or girl with the beautiful idea that's going to change the world. You do get those. And those are you know, the unicorns that, that could be created. And VCs will do that. They will invest in some, some ideas like that. But they do know that out of the 10, they'll only have one that'll succeed. But they have the money to do that. So if you don't have that funding to invest in 10 and then only one succeed, and you know that's the ratio... And you need to make sure that whatever you're investing in is going to actually bring in, that's going to be a good investment. You need to do a bit of more due diligence. You have to know who you're investing in. You have to back the right jockey. So the whole building public strategy is, I speak to founders. I say, don't go after investment until your business is at a certain size. Until it's, because you're also going to give away a lot more equity if you do, if you do that. Yes. You want to- the, the risk yes, is higher. The risk is high. So you want to do what you're doing regardless of investment. Don't let investment be that determining factor if you're going to start or not. Get get going. Start it. It has. To, it can just be small. Get that one client. Start small. Build it up. It'll show investors that you have grit. You have passion. You're not going to get. Nothing's going to stop you, regardless if you're going to get money or not. And those are the entrepreneurs. Those are the gems that you, the unicorns that you want to invest in. Because it's not about you getting investment to get to start something. 
It's about you just starting and getting it going. And you, hello, high water, you'll get it, get it going and you'll start this business. I want to champion those invest, those entrepreneurs. I want to champion them. I want to get, take them on this journey of build in public, show people what they're doing, how they're bootstrapping these ideas and businesses to a point that it needs VC investment or angel investment. And then invite the investors along the way. So if you're an investor and you want to invest in a business, as a VC said to me, investors don't invest in dots, they invest in lines. So they're going to look at this business, they're going to observe it, they're going to learn, they're going to see what you're doing, they're going to play an observer role until a certain point. And if they like what they see, they like the person, they like the personality, they see that it's doing well, they can see the, the figures are, are well, the budgets are there, that's the perfect time to put capital into a business because they'll use that capital not to not to run the business, but they'll use it to grow the business to a point that it'll steer return because you want a 10 extra investment when you invest. And it's not going to happen if you just invest in an idea because it'll take them years to, to reach a profit. And they'll burn through your investment very quickly. So you don't want to invest in just people with ideas. You want to invest in businesses that don't need investment. If that's, if that's a, a good way to put it. That is a very big confrontation for new business owners to actually ask ourselves, can we demonstrate that we are people who do not need the money to grow because we have yeah. already shown that we can grow, but to scale exponentially, that's where the investment goes. And Absolutely. it's really a yardstick, right? To say, it's are the, you ready for investment? I have a little question. Yeah. yeah, go for it. About your investments that your company has made in startups that then didn't make it and the lessons learned. How do you feel that building in public would have helped them to oh. show you that they're the right jockeys? Because that would yeah. have really made them companies that don't need the money, probably. And yeah. uh, then also how it could have ensured success once they were there. 100%. If the founders that we invested in from the get-go, if they had to do the bill in public and that to, to bootstrap, it's probably we we probably wouldn't have invested in them. It separates the the germ from the chaff, if you, if I had to say that. It separates that individual that that you want to invest in. And if if I actually if they did what I what I preach and, and they go about it and I had to follow them, I would you would see the kind of personality traits to how the business you I probably wouldn't have invested in them. But because they came with a great pitch and the sale was great. Mm -hmm. So this is why a lot of investors get caught into it. The sale is great from the get-go. Get but they don't have the, some of the, the founders and people that want to start business don't have that grit and tenacity to actually go and make it happen. Because also, and this is also why a lot of startups fail when they get investment from the beginning. They don't, they don't go through challenge from the get-go. And as we know, diamonds are built under pressure. So if you don't start on the back foot from the beginning and you get the money that you need, you're not going to build that, that, that diamond that you want, that you want to invest in. You know, it's going to be this thing I can put into, into animal kingdom terms. You're going to invest in a poodle and then that poodle is going to be in the wild. He's not going to survive. It's not going to happen. You know, you want to invest in a, a lion or a cheetah that's built from, from grit and grain and then is in the wild. And that's the kind of business that you want to invest in. So if you invest in a startup from the get-go and you give them money, they don't have to fight for everything that they, that they want. And that's the, it'll get to a point when they fought so much that those are the individuals that you want because any challenge, they'll overcome it. So, you know, that whole saying overnight success takes 10 years. Those are the, the individuals you want to invest in. It took them 10 years to get to a certain point. And you want to be, you want to be at, the, at the precipice of investment to get them to that overnight success. So that's the trick when you want to invest in companies. And I think, you know, I've spoken to a lot of investors and, and this is what I've really come to, to realize is this, is how, this is how a lot of people guarantee that their investments aren't going to be wasted and squandered. There's also a reason why, and this is a good analogy, why banks won't lend you money. You have to prove that you don't need the money before you lend it if that makes sense. So if you yes. buy a house, you have to prove that you don't need that money. You can actually, you can actually afford to, you can afford on a monthly basis to pay back and whatnot. You don't, you have to have obviously your salary, you have to have other assets, you have to have other things. So you have to prove you don't need the money to get the money, which is a weird concept, you know, but it's the same kind of thing with, with, with this building public approach where I'm going to do this with even without money. I don't need your your investment. It would be great because it will get me. It will get us to the next level. 
Mm. But we're going to do this regardless. It might take me a few more years, but I am going to be pushing hard and fast to get to our goals. And if you want to come on the journey, let's do it. And those are the businesses, you know? So yeah, it's a, it's something, it's a good concept. And then that's at the end of the day, when when you are looking for investment as a business, just taking any investment is also a really bad decision. You don't want to just get, take any investment from any investor because it comes with a lot of strings attached. You want to be able to, to bring on an investor that's not just going to add capital, but going to add smart capital. Smart capital that can introduce you to people, the network, the value, the mentorship, to really take not just the money they give you, but to accelerate their value that is not just money. And those are the best investors to look at. So the whole build in public really also introduces you to, the, to those kind of people, but it also gives you options. You don't need to just take on any investor. You can, investors should be pitching to you, to be honest, and they should be saying, right, this is our, what we're going to offer. This is how we can work together. This is the value I'm going to be giving, bringing to the table. That's a perfect marriage in heaven made. If you have that business and that investor that can add ultimate value to each other. Yeah. That is such a brilliant insight, Renee, because that builds on the idea of not needing the money because that puts you in a negotiating position about which investments you accept. Because a lot of startups have come out of investments, even so-called angel investments, uh, venture capital investments, and they have regretted the choices that they made because you are still the, you're the one who makes it happen. But what have you signed away when, uh, when you actually do eventually make that choice? So being in a negotiating position and actually letting the investors pitch you, that is definitely a, a perfect world to be in. Definitely. Really fascinating. Now, one of the questions I usually ask visionaries is how did you discover that this visionary message is the one that you want to share? And you've said a little bit about your uh, creative agency, Social Animal, right? Yep. And there, there must be more to this because there's a big shift from doing just the social media element and, and the online material to actually looking at investment and building companies. How did that call come to you? By all means, we're also a startup, uh, even though we're 13 years uh, old. We, I would say we are still a startup. I'm, I'm taking our journey as a, as a bit of you know, motivation as well and passion. Yes, we are seen as a mid-sized company at the moment uh, from a staff and revenue perspective, but I still see ourselves as, as a fledgling. You know, I see ourselves as still so much to do. And I come across all these wonderful entrepreneurs, especially with the LinkedIn business that we so in the agency, we have a LinkedIn personal branding and social selling element where we manage business owners, founders, CEOs, and MDs. And I've seen how this build in public um, approach has benefited them in such a big way, not just from funding, but from a client attraction perspective, from a talent attraction perspective, from a partner attraction perspective, you, you become you become infectious. You want you, people want to be part of your part of your circle and your energy because you're exuding this energy on on LinkedIn, and uh, it's a very powerful platform to do that because the business world is there. They're consuming content. They're looking. They're observing, and it just creates this essence and this energy around the businesses that we help that people want to be part of. So we've taken it. We've helped a few businesses uh, get funding uh, through this the strategy, and we have a few more that we're helping now at the moment. Uh, so we don't just take on any business uh, from the from the startup perspective. It, it has to be a unique idea. It has to go through a few uh, hurdles before that. But it's it's something that I'm very passionate about because I love entrepreneurship. I love entrepreneurs that can. That that are that are comfortable in the most uncomfortable situations, and I those are my those are my tribe members because I love that kind of stuff. I love people that can that can take a problem and actually create something and get a solution to that problem and actually create economy behind it. And the passion behind it, it's it's those individuals that I want to build and champion and and put them out there so that the world can see that we have fantastic talent, especially in South Africa and in Africa. And really, really show the kind of entrepreneurial spirit that we have, because we have a very unique entrepreneurial kind of talents, uh, you know, especially here in Africa, because we, we don't get anything in this, in, in this continent. No one gives us anything, especially in South Africa as well. We don't, we don't get any, any, any help from anyone. We literally in the wild fending for ourselves and making it work. Um, We're not so poodles. There's, <laughs> there's no, no, there's no poodles at all. So if you, if you can succeed in business in Africa, you can succeed anywhere in the world. Hands down. So there's a reason why a lot of international, uh, well, a lot of countries internationally want entrepreneurs from South Africa to come into their countries because they know that they 
they are such hard workers. Their spirit is so high. They, because we, we, we face with daily problems, daily, daily problems. And we have to make sure that we, we, we overcome these problems to, to run a business. It's exceptionally challenging. And with every problem, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. So this is why we, we do what we do, champion those entrepreneurs that, uh, that are doing it, that are in the field, that are grinding away, uh, that are building, that are, that are actually building something for their legacy, for their employees. It's not just about money. It's about creating a sustainable business for the people around them and being able to, to help as many people as possible. I think that's, that, that's what's key. That's really an insight. Yes. And that is the story of you. Now, I'd love to ask you if there is a standout story of your work with your clients that really comes to mind as an example of what you can do for people and what your visionary work has made possible for them. Cool. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll say one client, uh, you know, we, we help Ocean Basket, you know, we help Grace at Ocean Basket. She's the CEO there. And they've really taken LinkedIn in their stride. And, and she's such an eccentric leader that's, that's leading from the front and also building in public. She's showing individuals how Ocean Basket is growing internationally because it is a, a, a local brand. Um, and Grace is such a wonderful person. She, she really has taken you know, the, the concept of building public and leading from the front to the next level. So go and follow her. Go and see what she does. There's no videos that are edited, you know, lights, camera, it's literally real, authentic on the phone, her in the field. She's in the restaurants with her team members and it attracts investment and attracts people that want to speak to Grace about getting Ocean Basket in their countries and, and getting it expanded internationally. So she's really leading and, and investors are looking at this like, wow, I want to be part of this because we have the CEO that's like really eccentric and driving from the front. It's absolutely phenomenal. So she gets a lot of engagement. Um, and her platforms become the most powerful social asset they have in the whole company. So her, her content gets more traction, engagement, and interaction than any of her company posts put together. And they've got half a million people on Facebook, 200,000 on, on Instagram. Uh, so it's quite phenomenal what she's done there. And, and we helping her do that and, and guiding her along the way and managing that profile for her. Because she doesn't have time to do that. She's in the field, taking photos, videos. We're just communicating her essence on this platform. And it's a, it's a PR initiative as well uh, at the end of the day. That's really incredible because a lot of leaders feel I'm out there doing the work. You know, why do I have to do this stuff too? I've got a team for that. But yep. when a leader actually takes on board that idea of their visibility becoming something that is so much of an asset to the company, that's really phenomenal. And, yeah, and it's so great to see the results of that happening as well. So there's another one for my LinkedIn follow list. Thank you for that. Don't follow her. It's, it's so refreshing to see what she's doing. And she's she's with her team members. She's she's traveling the world. It's it's awesome. And she's she's got very strong opinions about the restaurant industry and and how to run a good business. And it's mm. beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the profiles that I would highly recommend follow if you want to know. How to lead a company successfully. Grace is that epitome of how to lead a, a company successfully. Wow. See, now there you touch on the power of personal brand and yeah. how that intersects with a company because any member of a company, well, especially if they're right at the top, but they're all an ambassador for that organization that they're associated with. And uh, yeah. you know how well LinkedIn supports this, right? If somebody follows Ocean Basket, they're going to be seeing that an employee from Ocean Basket has posted that will go to their feed and they then have a better chance of seeing what the different employees do. Yeah. But for um, that member of a team themselves, that means their personal brand is also bolstered by this. And there's even more about that waits for the future. It creates new opportunities for them when they uh, eventually decide, well, you know, they might be speaking about leadership next. It could Definitely. evolve into the rest of the career. What are your, uh, you shared a lot about how the personal brand, brand element has empowered Grace of Ocean Basket. Now, how do you almost persuade people to really embrace their uniqueness in their personal brand and really make it authentic and also just have the courage? You know, a lot of people fear that limelight. In a lot of the work that I've done with visionaries, I've seen it can be so scary to take that step and become public yeah, about what we're doing that it can paralyze people for a long time. Yeah. So there's a lot to this that's almost motivation and not just the just go out there and do it, but actually helping them to open their mindset to Definitely. how that personal brand helps them, especially on a platform like LinkedIn. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll give I'll give some advice, and I say this to to all clients and anyone that's going to start this journey. You can't please everyone in life. You you're going to have supporters and you're going to have haters, and you need to focus on your supporters. And you can't you can't be amazing to everyone. It's not going to happen. Everyone's polarized in a certain way. They're unique in certain ways. And actually, the more polarizing you are, the better, to be honest. And also in business, you can't do business with everyone in the world. It's just physically impossible. You can do business with a few hundred people, if, if not a few thousand, if you're a bigger business. And that you need to focus on is those are the supporters that you need to focus on. The, the haters don't even focus on it. You are going to people that are going to be negative. You are going to people that don't like what you say. And what I say to a lot of individuals starting this journey, you have to just know that your first hundred posts are going to be horrible. It is what it is. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be great. You're not going to get the engagement. But because we live in a society of instant gratification, we think that by posting for one month every day, we're going to get what we need. It doesn't work like that. It's a continual walking that, that journey. You have to keep doing it day in and day out. Consistency trumps anything. So if you're consistent and going at it every single day, it will happen. That's what I say to clients. You will get following. You will. It will happen. You will become someone they wanna they wanna be with, and you're gonna attract that that, that business. But it's knowing that your first hundred are gonna be horrible, and your second hundred are gonna be okay, and then your your third hundred is gonna be much better. So you just need to know that it's not about the results that you get in the beginning. It's about building the consistency muscle to keep doing it day in and day out. And I mean, this is, you see this in nature. The rivers that we look at is not there because of a week of water. It's, it's hundreds of years of water flowing in that, in that area, thousands, if not thousands. And, and, that's, and, and, and eventually it gets to the sea. So either way, be water, just keep going and, uh, and be fluid. You know, it's change and adjust where you need to, because that's going to happen. You, within this experience, you're going to understand what works, what doesn't work, which posts are doing well, which posts didn't do well, and evaluate and, and, and look at the data and then keep going where it works. So by not doing it, you're just doing yourself a disservice. Just keep doing it and keep putting yourself out there. And, and yes, you, you're going to challenge your comfort zone. It's going to happen. And, uh, but we're not, we don't grow without, without being challenged and stepping out of our comfort zone. So we need to be always expanding and it does hurt a bit to expand it, you are uncomfortable but then you know you're in the you, you're going you on the right path if it's a bit uncomfortable and uh, when you do grow that uncomfort becomes comfort you start getting more comfortable doing these uncomfortable things that's when you need to start doing more things that are uncomfortable so you have to keep growing as an individual and uh yeah listen it's not for everyone but if you do want to try it you can't it's it's, it's not going to harm you in any way it's not going to uh, it's not going to be negative it's going to be only positive at the end of the day I have to say that is something where when people have concerns about social media, I have to say LinkedIn is a really, really safe environment because yeah. everybody's real name is there. Their company affiliation yeah. is there. People behave nicely on LinkedIn. So it really is a really There's no safe toxicity. place to do that. Yeah. This is why I'm not a fan of Twitter um, because mm, it's hostile. You, can be, you can be Dave today and Jeff tomorrow. And you can troll and you can be negative and you can say hurtful things and nothing will ever happen. On LinkedIn, it's it's linked to your, you as a person. LinkedIn does require IDs at, at times. So it's that individual is linked to your professional brand. You don't, you, you're very careful with how you say certain things. And the LinkedIn community is exceptionally positive. It's helping you build. You build up others. That's why I love it. It's such a positive platform. And if someone is super negative and they're trolling, the community actually latches onto it and they and they actually take care of that. I mean, if you if I post something and someone says something negative, I can guarantee you that my followers will latch onto that and say, "What are you doing?" No, like you know, they'll they'll actually they'll they'll go after that. So I must say, you know, it's 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 a beautiful platform to be just from positive perspective and building up. You know, it really gives you this energy, like, "Wow, I'm going to do this. It's going to happen." So yeah, that's why I love it as well. That's it. I, I'm also such a raving fan of LinkedIn for just all the potential that it offers and the fact that it puts so much that used to be really difficult to do under one roof, really yeah. putting it a, a click or a tap away, whether it's doing live audio broadcasts or publishing an article that's going to have far reach. The thing I love most is the domain authority that LinkedIn yeah. gives you because Generally, Google your name and your LinkedIn profile comes up first on the first page of Google. It's really Definitely. incredible. So lots of power there. And one of the things that happens, because you have a wide range of expertise, but 
very often if people walk into a room with you and I've seen this happen all their LinkedIn questions are going to come at you and the one that I am hear a lot of people asking at the moment is so there's so much fuss about LinkedIn at the moment, but specifically about the power of video. So across social media, we're seeing how much video can do for you. You've mentioned how compelling it is when we can share real videos, as in the case of, of Grace, of o Ocean Basket. And um, we do see very often the different platforms are going to prioritize this. There are rumors about the LinkedIn algorithm that say, if people stay on a post longer, you're going to get yeah. more views and more attraction. So there is a lot of power in video. How important do you think it is for people to post video? How much of the content do you feel it should be? And um, is it essential? I, I'll be honest. L video is amazing and it's very great. And, and if you can do it, if you want to do it, do it. Amazing. But you don't have to do it. I don't do a lot of video personally. I'm not as comfortable as a lot of people. So, you know, there's a lot of big names out there, big profiles, big followings that never do video. So it's not, it's not to say that it's going to be a make or break in your journey at all. I, I would rather post a video like this from, from a podcast perspective as a, as a post, but I'm also, you know, I, I'm not as comfortable as a lot of people. So I just, I do what I'm, what I'm comfortable with. And I do do some video, like it's not, I don't do, I don't do it at all. It's not like I don't do it at all, but if it's going to hamper you from starting and it's going to hamper you from doing anything, don't let it hamper you. Just keep doing what you, what you want to do. And if you are someone that wants to put out pictures or just text, beautiful, that's your brand. That's who you are. Put it mm -hmm. out there. I say to you, I say to anyone, I will meet you. I will, even if you're an intern or if you an assistant or if you need some advice, I am quite accessible. I will meet you. You won't waste my time because it also gives me energy helping other people. So if anything, they're actually giving me more than I'm giving them. So, so I say that to a lot of people that if, if you need help, if you need advice, please speak to me, ask me questions. It gives me great passion and great kind of energy to help other people. So it doesn't matter if you're a CEO or an intern, it doesn't matter at all. I will take the time and speak to you and I'll give you advice. And, you know, if I have the time, we'll, we'll, we'll do it together and I'll show you um, because it gives me great energy to do that. And it gives me great joy to do that. It's the giving mindset. It's that give and then you will receive type of mindset. And I think, I think that's also something you have to, you have to deploy in, in your daily life, in the LinkedIn world. You have to always be what is it in for that? How am I going to get that person to the next level? Because they will then become a cheerleader and they'll support you and they'll help you. And that's how you get also that engagement. You know, you, you, you supporting everyone else and then they start supporting you. So, so that's, that's the kind of, kind of mentality behind it. LinkedIn is a beautiful ecosystem for this. The, the idea of really giving and not giving to get, but really Definitely. giving because there is that strong sense of community. And I think it creates the culture. We, especially people who come into LinkedIn new, are going to follow the example of the people yep. that they see. So exactly. actually modeling best practice, and that's something that you do exceptionally well, yeah. is really a, a great way to establish I'll the culture because you never know who's watching. I'll give you actually a very, very good example. There was a, there was an intern that reached out to me and said, I need, I need some help. Can, do you mind have putting a bit of time? You know, I, you're probably very busy. You probably won't reply. Like I said, no, 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 not at all. Like here's my link. Let's book a chat. Obviously knowing that this individual will not buy from us at all for, for maybe for the next few years, because they are just starting their work journey. So I said, let me give you some advice. I'm going to show you how to do things. I spent an hour with the individual. That person went I think to lunch or dinner the next week with their family members. And they're like, wow, I met this guy Renee, on LinkedIn. He gave me some advice. Her uncle actually was a CEO of a company. And he's like, wow, that's awesome. And got the details. He reached out, became a client. So oh if I had to say no to the intern, because are oh, you wasting my time? It would have never been able to give me this introduction to the CEO that now we do business with. So don't say no to people, regardless of their standing or if they can give you something or not. You never know where it could lead. You never know what could actually come from it. Yes, very, very interesting. I, I had an odd parallel experience recently. I was arriving at an event. I was told that this is the name of the person who will meet me there. And uh, she, you know, was managing the event or something like this. Uh, the next day, I looked her up and realized she was the director of the company. And, Amazing. And, <laughs> and people are often very carefully hidden, right? And really knowing, and this is a part of our building in public experience, is we really do have the chance to make a difference Definitely. through 
the, the things that we're out there doing. And that public element, this is something that's hard to avoid in a time that we talk a lot about privacy. But the fact is, if you're going to be starting a company, if you are going to be working in a way that is compatible with the digital world, and that means international opportunity at the moment, you're going to have visibility. So you might as well Absolutely. use it well. Might as well embrace it and use it and enjoy it. Enjoy the journey. It's good. It's, it's a beautiful journey. And it's a game at the end of the day. Don't take it too seriously. It's, uh, you know, enjoy it and take every problem and success in its stride and know that anything can happen. Absolutely. Rainier, is there another question I should be asking you that I haven't asked yet? The one that you're think, itching to ask. I think you've asked some great questions, I must say. Um, so appreciate that. I think we've gotten, gone through quite a bit. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Awesome. Well, then I would love to ask you, where is the best place for other visionaries to find you? On LinkedIn, definitely. I'm always on there. I'm available. Go and, go and chat to me. Go and connect. Go and follow. Uh, I'll follow you back. I'll connect. And uh, if you need any advice, if you want to know a bit more about what we do, welcome to, to, to reach out and, and I'll be able to help. Well, you've set a precedent now, hey? <laughs> and that sounds really, really great. And um, what is worth mentioning is we'll have your links in the uh, description to the episode. Perfect. But also, uh, Rainier, I do want to also say, you know, people are now hearing that you um, have looked at and you have practiced investing in the past. So you have also given us the caution before approaching you for funding that people should be able to show that they are first building in public and that they don't need the money. And then they'll, you'll know, they're the right jockey to back, right? Definitely. I'll give them all the advice they need and I'll even help them along the way um, and point them in the right direction, connect them with the right people. So, and, and just a last advice for entrepreneurs. If you want to do something, do it. Regardless if, you, if you're going to get the money or not, just start, get that one client, just start as small as possible. The seeds do grow into big trees um, and just make it work. You don't need funding. A lot of businesses just don't need funding. You can do things without funding. That is so, so priceless. Renee, you might have seen in my guest guidelines, I mentioned a piece of podcast guesting advice that I was given, and that is always show up to a podcast with the idea that people are paying each person hearing it is paying ten thousand dollars to hear you speak and yeah. i think today you have given more value than that in potential opportunities for every person listening i really appreciate Amazing. having you with us today and uh, look forward to seeing you building public thank you very much Mary. really appreciate it uh, thank you chat to you soon You've been listening to the League of Visionaries podcast by Yazi Media, proudly brought to you by Totally Morpheus. Subscribe to the League of Visionaries podcast here on your favorite podcasting platform and follow Yazi Media on LinkedIn to find out more about how you can share your visionary message with the world. If you are a visionary, chances are you are also a leader. But what is your current leadership state? The way you are leading right now, your default setting, if you will. The Egg 3 Leadership Assessment helps you to understand the way you lead, your strengths, and your potential challenges as a leader. And most importantly, how to create your unique leadership legacy. It's fast. It's fun. It's free. It's the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment from Totally Morpheus. And when you take this assessment, you will get an instant report right away, pointing the way to your living leadership legacy. Find the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment now at totallymorpheus.com.